The top stories tonight in Y News. The Department of Health confirmed the local transmission of the highly transmissible Omicron XBB subvariant and XBC variant. Bureau of Corrections Director General Gerald Bantag has been placed under indefinite suspension by Malacanang. The Philippine Statistics Authority began implementing the issuance of digital versions of the Philippine Identification System. A veteran journalist claims that the country needs nonprofit news organization to uphold the truth and in information. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Friday, October 21, 2022. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. I am William Theo. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UN TV News and Rescue social media channels. I am Hardy Delgado. First in the news, the onset of the northeast monsoon started and the gradual cooling of air temperature is expected in the coming days. But Pagasa said that the country, especially the eastern section, may also experience above normal rainfall. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. According to the Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or Pagasa, La Nina may enhance the northeast monsoon. When La Nina exists, the Western Pacific is warmer and more rainfall will be experienced. Sa ngayon na nakikita natin, no, contributing factor yung La Nina. Kasi alam natin, pag La Nina talaga magiging maulan dito sa eastern section ng bansa at pwedeng umabot hanggang dito sa Mindanao area. Pag-asa said, colder temperature will be experienced especially those in mountainous areas like Baguio City, Tagaytay City, and Tanay in Rizal. The coldest temperature recorded was in Baguio City with 6.3 degrees Celsius on January 18, 1961. Pagasa said that lower temperature may also be recorded this season. Possible, hindi natin tinatanggal yung possibility na ma-break yun kasi nga, depende yun dun sa magiging takbo pa ng uh, mga weather systems na makaka-apekto sa atin. Like kung nyari, kung may dumaan pang bagyo dun sa area, lalo sa bagyo, so mas mapapababa pa nito yung na-reach na uh, minimum temperature, yung uh, pinakababang recorded natin na temperature. In Manila, the coldest temperature recorded was 15.1 degrees Celsius on February 4, 1987 and December 30, 1988. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Samahang Industriya ng Agrikultura or SINAG welcomes the decision of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. to stay as the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. Nel Maripapok will tell us why. The Agriculture Group Samahang Industriya ng Agrikultura or SINAG has agreed to President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. decision to stay as the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. According to Rosendo So, President of SINAG, President Marcos should revamp the officials of DA. Parahin pa tayong problema sa DA, no? Uh, of course, yung mga corrupt official na sa loob pa. And uh, we, we, we need to, ano, uh, revamp talaga yung mga tao sa loob. And of course, uh, uh, yung programa ng ano, uh, Department of Agriculture, eh, ma mas maganda ko natin si President. The group hoped that the president will focus on resolving the agri-smuggling issue and look into the importation of various agricultural products and goods that could kill the local sector. That is the reason why the group wants the president to stay as agri-chief. Sa tingin natin, uh, mas, ma mas maganda. And of course, uh, uh, yung mga ibang corrupt official, eh, medyo natutak. But according to Professor Dennis Coronacion, a political analyst, it is high time for the president to appoint a full-time agri-secretary. But of course, alam mo naman yung limitasyon ng kakayan na isang tao, no? Uh, you can only do so much. Hindi mo pwedeng mabigyan ng attention ng lahat. Mm -hmm. Because as president, you need to uh, give attention to all of the problems of this country. 
So, baka yung problema pa lang ng agriculture, uh, pulang, pulang ang kalahating araw o isang araw eh. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, there is already a localized community transmission of both the Omicron subvariant XBB and XBC variant of the COVID-19 virus in some regions of the country. DOH Epidemiology Bureau Director Dr. Alethea de Guzman stated that localized community transmission of the Omicron subvariant XBB has been documented in Western Visayas and the same for the XBC variant in Davao Region and Soxargen. Meanwhile, de Guzman stated that there is currently insufficient data to support localized community transmission in other places with occurrences of both XBB and XBC. Previously, the DOH reported 60 local cases of Omicron XBB subvariant in Western Visayas, with one local case discovered in the Davao region. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. says COVID-19 must no longer be treated as an emergency. The president also confirms that he has yet to live the state of calamity in the country. Asha Kadaban Jr. tells us why. The COVID-19 situation in the country is now far different from what it was in the last two years. This is based on the number of hospitalization and deaths, while those with comorbidities are the ones who succumb to the disease. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. explains this, emphasizing that we cannot look at COVID-19 the same way it was on the onset of the pandemic. We must treat COVID no longer as an emergency, but something that we will have to manage forever. Uh, it's like flu, like pneumonia. Uh, nandyan lagi yan, pero mag-ingat tayo para hindi tayo magkasakit. And that is the way that we should be handling COVID. President Marcus Jr., however, says it does not help if we are still under the state of calamity and remains to be the only country that has the mask protocols. But he also aims to let the benefits of the state policy continue despite the decreasing number of COVID-19 cases. We cannot remove ourselves yet from the way that we are handling it. Dahil, halimbawa, pag... Pag tinanggal ko yung state of calamity, sa, uh, hindi makukuha ng, ben, ng ating mga health workers yung kanilang beneficyo na nasa batas. Uh, hindi tayo makakapag-import ng vaccine yung sa procurement. Masyadong mabagal ang magiging procurement. The president assures they are looking for other ways to normalize the situations to attract more foreign investors and tourists in the country. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And in other news, the Department of Foreign Affairs has confirmed that passport applicants can use their national IDs as a valid identification card. In a statement, the DFA said beginning October 21st, the Office of Consular Affairs will honor the digitized version of the Philippine ID system. The agency also reminds applicants that their printed e-fill ID should be clear, readable, and contain the same details as the presented documentary requirements during the passport application. For more information, visit the DFA website. In a bid to address millions of housing backlogs in the country, the Marcos administration plans to build one million housing units every year for six years. This report will tell us why. The Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, or DSUD, plans to build one million housing units per year for informal settler families, or ISFs, across the country. DSUD Secretary Jerry Acuzar says President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos wants this to be a priority program under his term. The agency is requesting for an additional budget of 36 billion pesos to be used for the interest subsidy to initially finance the program. Kung gagawin po natin yung, uh, yung traditional na ginagawa po ba ng karang administrasyon, ay one-to-one -one po yun. With this idea po, pag 36 billion hiningin at ginamit po natin sa interest subsidy, makakasundo po tayo ng 1 trillion o 1 million houses, almost 1.2 trillion pesos sa private sector. Hindi po, hindi po kakayanin ng gobyerno yung ganyang kalaki amount. Yung private sector po ang maraming pera sa labas, sa mga banko at sa capital market. 
The housing project will be called Bamban Sampabahay para sa Pilipino program or four piece. Under the program, medium to high rise buildings with 24 square meters per unit will be built depending on the needs of the locality. Ang location natin is in city. Kaya ho gusto natin mag high rise. Hindi natin sila itatapon outside the city where they, yung livelihood nila na dito, yung mga ISF areas, doon po natin mismo itatayo as much as possible para yung beneficiaries will be acceptable to them then yung yung paglilipatan nila. Kasi kailangan yung kultura rin natin, we take into account, eh, no? that's why I worry about your high rise. I, I, worry about, ni... I worry about the 20-story building with our uh, kultura natin. Eh. Uh, ano yun? Common areas. Uh, medyo wala pa yata sa kultura natin yun na uh, we share the expenses for common areas. The agency adds this will also help poor Filipinos in their monthly payments. Madami pong uh, kamag- kababayan po tayo, hindi makaabot po ng 6,000 pesos na monthly amortization. So balit, with the uh, interest uh, sub support, bababa po yun from 6,000 to around 3,000 pesos per month. Ngayon po, kung talaga pang hindi pa rin buabot ng ating kababayan, pwede pa hong maglagay po yung local government naman ng tinatawag namin na amortization support. The agency is appealing to lawmakers to consider augmenting their budget. The decent originally requested an almost 96 billion peso budget for next year. However, only 3.9 billion pesos was approved by the budget department, only 4% of the agency's proposal. Currently, the country's housing backlog is at 6.5 billion housing units. If they continue with business as usual, Akuzar says this might reach as high as 10.9 million by 2028. Harleen Delgado, you when TV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Bureau of Corrections confirmed that they had no records of a person deprived of liberty by the name of Crisanto Palana Villamor Jr. Villamor was the alleged mailman in the Percy Labid sleigh based on the statement of the self-confessed gunman Joel Escorial. Leia Ilagan will tell us why. The Philippine National Police will investigate the alleged middleman who died inside the New Bilibid prison. PNP Deputy Chief for Administration, Police Lieutenant General Rudel Sarmonia said they will determine if Crisanto Palana Villamor Jr. and June Globa Villamor are the same person. The PNP reacted after the Bureau of Correction said they did not have records under the name Crisanto Palana Villamor Jr. Instead, they have June Villamor who died on October 18. But still, part of the investigation to establish the real identity. Uh, yun po ang alamin po natin kasi nga po wala po June Villamor po yung namatay. Iba po kasi yung pangalan na binanggit ni Ganman. We're still in the process of identifying yung true identity whether yung binanggit niya or yung namatay is different or the same person. Self-confessed gunman Joel Escorial stated in the October 18 press conference that a middleman who ordered them to kill Percy Lapid was inside a Bilibid. General Sermonia added that due to the death of June Villamor, the PNP ensures the safety of the other middleman detained in BJMP. The PNP is also securing June's cousin Jose Palana Villamor. Well secured na po yung nasa BJMP. So yung BJMP well secured, nalipat na. Yung uh, isa naman na person of interest natin na galing sa Bucor, kamag-anak naman ito ng namatay, ay uh, ni-request na rin po natin. Pero uh, hindi po siya kwan, ha, suspect, kamag-anak po ito mismo na siya rin makakatulong sa investigasyon na ito. Meanwhile, SITG Supervisor Police Brigadier General Kirby John Kraft said they are now looking for the person who deposited the 550,000 pesos on Escorial account. The amount mentioned is payment for the death of Percy Lapid. So, ang atin na lang pong ginagawa ay nag-coordinate po tayo sa sinasabing banko upang mabigyan tayo ng mga CCTV footages. Uh, at matukoy din natin kung uh, sino nag-deposito nito. The SITG still hopes that they will unmask the mastermind and put him behind bars as soon as possible. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. 
Bureau of Corrections Director General Gerald Bantag has been placed under indefinite suspension by Malacanang. This was after the death of an inmate who was allegedly involved in the killing of veteran broadcast Percival Mabasa or Percy Lapid. Dante Amento tells us why. The Department of Justice wants to know the reason behind the death of one of the alleged middlemen in the Percy Lapid killing case. Hence, the DOJ ordered the National Bureau of Investigation or NBI to probe on the case. Autopsy on the remains has already been conducted and the NBI is set to release their toxicology report. We immediately sent a team of NBI yesterday uh, to, to conduct an autopsy. And there were all many witnesses. The alleged middleman died on October 18 inside the New Bilibid prison after the self-confessed gunman Joel Escorial revealed his alleged cohorts of the crime. Kahapon ko lang nalaman itong ano, uh, view core angle nito because I was never informed from October 18 about this. Kahapon lang when Secretary Avalos called me that the person had died. No? So I, I tried to find out everything I could. Meanwhile, Biocor Director General Gerald Bantag is being put under preventive suspension for 90 days while the investigation is ongoing. Justice Secretary Boeing Rimuli explained this is for the sake of fair and impartial probe. He asked me to preventively suspend uh, Under Secretary Director General uh, Gerald Bantag of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Biocor so that there may be a fair, impartial uh, investigation on the matter, so that the old doubts will be put to rest that there are no sacred cows in this administration. Bantag will be temporarily replaced by former AFP Chief of Staff Gregorio Pio Catapang Jr. as Bucor officer in charge. As President uh, we agreed that uh, he may be the best person to, you know, to, to, to step in as OIC, given his maturity, his ability to discern uh, his experience, uh, he, may, he may be a good fit to us, OIC. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Philippine Statistics Authority began implementing the issuance of digital versions of the Philippine Identification System. JP Duñez reports why. The government is still inclined to issue at least 50 million credentials of national ID by the end of the year. However, of the 74 million Filipinos who have registered for the Philippine Identification System, only 22 million are set to receive their printed national ID cards. To augment the backlog of printed ID cards, PSA starts the issuance of digital version of national ID or the e-fill ID which can be printed. This aims to be issued to those Filipinos who have completed their registration and yet to receive their national ID. Registered persons may visit the link provided by the PSA to check if they were issued Filsis number. Once Filsis number is generated, they may proceed to Filsis registration sites to have their printed version of their national ID. Ito sa e-fill ID, uh, una, maraming printers kasi Ang, mga, ang printing nito ay sa mga registration centers. Eh. Our target for the physical card as uh, uh, committed to uh, the president is that we will produce 30 million physical cards and 20 million e-fill ID cards by December 31, 2022. Unlike the official national ID cards, e-fill IDs will be printed on a piece of paper but it still contains the personal information of the holder, its picture, and the security feature, particularly the QR code. PSA assures that e-fill ID has the same validity and functionality as the physical card that could be utilized for the benefits from the government and other official transactions. PSA is also coordinating with the government and other private institutions to guarantee the printed e-fill ID's acceptance. JP Nunez, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God.
British Prime Minister Liz Truss resigns from her role as leader of the Conservative Party and as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom after just six weeks in office. The process has now begun to find a new UK Prime Minister with the governing party by next week, Friday. From London, United Kingdom, here's Anna Lima to tell us why live. Yes, Anna? Yes, Jonah, UK Prime Minister Liz Truss announced yesterday outside Number 10 Downing Street that she is resigning from her post as head of the governing Conservative Party and as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, just six weeks after succeeding to the role. This comes after her proposed fiscal plans gained immense criticisms from co-lawmakers and investors that caused the sterling pound to plunge in the market. Truss said that she could not deliver the mandate on which she was elected. On Wednesday night in the House of Commons, Truss attempted to salvage her leadership by defending her widely rejected economic plans, adding that she is a fighter and not a quitter, yet still received disapproval from her colleagues, asking Truss to step down immediately. When the mini-budget caused economic turmoil, Truss sacked Kwasi Kwarteng as British Chancellor, followed by the resignation of her Interior Secretary, Swella Braverman, who was involved in a technical breach of government rules. Truss lost two high-ranking ministers in less than a week. Her announcement of resignation yesterday made her as the shortest-serving Prime Minister in UK history after 45 days in office. Meanwhile, the opposing parties have called for a general election, including Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer, and Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt are rumoured to run for the next UK Premier. While Boris Johnson, who had previously been forced to resign in July due to anomalies, has many political supporters insisting that the former Prime Minister should make a comeback. The contenders will need at least 100 Tory MPs to be elected as Prime Minister. Joanna? Thank you, Anna. Reporting live from London, United Kingdom. The P Visor Incorporated multinational biopharmaceutical company expects a fourfold increase in its COVID 19 vaccine price in the United States in 2023. Ia Devera will tell us why live. <laughs> Yeah. Juna, the United States is currently providing free COVID-19 vaccine to all due to the public health emergency program. However, once the said purchase program expires, the U.S. is expecting to have a vaccine price increase. Pfizer executive Angela Lukin said the price of COVID-19 vaccine will be around 110 to 130 US dollars per dose next year. This is almost quadruple the price of the current 30 US dollars per dose that US government is paying to Pfizer and German partner BioNTech. Lukin added that she is expecting the vaccine will be provided for free to those who have private private insurance or government paid insurance. However, for those who have no health insurance, it is unclear what vaccination access will be provided. Moreover, Lucan said they are confident that U.S. price point of the COVID-19 vaccine will not be a barrier for patients' access. On Thursday, a news agency reported that such high price is expected by Wall Street due to the weaker COVID vaccine demand. Back to you, Jonah. Thank you, Ia, for that live report. As the midterm votes are fast approaching, U.S. President Joe Biden praised the country's improving infrastructure. Jane Robles will tell us why live. Yes, Jane? 
Jonah, on Thursday, U.S. President Joe Biden expressed the development of the United States infrastructure as he stood on the partially reconstructed bridge in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which collapsed in January. Instead of an infrastructure week which was introduced by ex-President Donald Trump, President Biden introduced the infrastructure decade, signing it into law. Well, with the help of your members of Congress here today, I signed into law a once-in-a-generation investment in roads, highways, bridges, railroads, ports, airports, and so much more, over a billion two hundred, a trillion two hundred billion dollars. It's called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and it's the most significant investment in American infrastructure, roads, bridges, et cetera, than Eisenhower's inter since Eisenhower's interstate highway system. In just the previous year alone, President Biden agreed to a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill into law, offering money for the improvement and development of transport services. The rebuilding of the fallen Pittsburgh Bridge, according to President Biden, now symbolizes the spark of the nation's infrastructure rehabilitation. Meanwhile, with the upcoming midterm elections, Pennsylvania is a key and important battleground state which can have an influence on the election results as Democratic Senate candidate John Fetterman was present. Back to you, Jonah. Thank you, Jane, for that live report. A new study has found that social interaction can help increase motivation to exercise. May Viandong will tell us why, live. Yes, Maeve? Giona's study by scientists from Kane University suggests that socializing with physically active people may boost an individual's motivation to exercise. The study found that when less active people interact with those who are more active, they are more encouraged to become more active as well. On the other hand, they found that people who are less social tend to exercise less. The scientists said that Exercising with someone gives an individual commitment and accountability, and that having someone that pushes you can be helpful for achieving long-term goals. They also added that activities such as social sports and fitness classes are a great way to combine exercise with socializing, as well as just walking around the park with friends. Jonah, they noted that regular exercise is an important part of people's lives as it has been proven that keeping an active lifestyle improves mental health significantly. Back to you, Giona. Thank you, May, for that live report. And those are the reasons behind the news in other parts of the globe. I am Giona Pravado, live from London, United Kingdom. Good evening. Misinformation has been spreading on social media. A veteran journalist says a non-profit news organization is needed to uphold the truth in providing information in the country. Eileen Cerudo explains why. A recent Pulse Asia survey revealed that 90% of Filipinos have read or watched fake news. Many also believe that the proliferation of fake news is one of the country's problems that needs to be solved. According to Charivilia, there should be a non-profit news organization that will provide accurate news which will fight against the misinformation and disinformation on social media. Dapat meron maglabi sa Kongreso na gumawa ng batas na mapoprotektahan itong grupong ito. I think we should all band together as yeah. professional uh, practitioners mm -hmm. and present to Congress na that we need to protect the truth and social media is not it. The veteran journalist also said there are paid trolls online who deliberately spread wrong information to mislead Filipinos. She also explains Filipinos tend to lessen the heaviness of an issue by using jokes and paid trolls use this kind of tactic to gain the attention of Filipinos. Tayo, we want to talk about kahit serious stuff na in jest. Kasi sa bigat, always we like to lighten issues by um, making fun of it or laughing about it. 
The non-profit news organization also aims to protect the truth and to widen the perspective of Filipinos. Other ways to defeat misinformation is educating Filipinos for them to verify information to determine whether it is fake news or not. Villia admitted it will be difficult to fight misinformation, especially in social media where the platform is a bit muddled. But the truth will prevail. Eileen Cerudo, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Our Kasambahay, as the world faces these trying times amid the pandemic caused by coronavirus, we are inviting everyone to join the Global Prayer for Humanity. Good day. I'm Brother Eli Soriano of the members of the Church of God International. I want to invite you to join us in a minute of prayer every day to pray for humanity and the whole world as we go through these perilous times. While safety measures like washing of hands and strengthening of our immune systems may help us through this horrible predicament, there is still no precaution or cure more powerful than God's mighty intervention. And we need His intervention now more than ever. It doesn't matter what religion you are in or what denomination you belong. This is an invitation for all the people around the world who cares for the future of their family, friends, loved ones, and humanity as a whole. Everybody is welcome to pray with us. For more details, you can check out the description box below. Thank you very much, and I hope to hear from you soon. May God bless you. close, we will leave you with a word, giving glory to God. From the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Behind the News, October 21, 2022. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I am Harleen Delgado. And because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.